another weekend. It is Friday, February 1st. Happy Friday, everyone. We have a great show here for you. The news headlines, weather report, and today in history. Matt Burnett, editor at Wareham Week newspaper, is here this morning. We'll touch base with him during the story of the day segment. I would like to take this moment to thank Not Your Average Antiques, an antique shop down Cranberry Highway in East Wareham for donating the props that you see in the Good Morning Wareham set. So stay tuned because the weather, traffic and the news headlines are next. Generally sunny out, out today with high at 25 degrees, clear skies tonight with low at 10 degrees. It is going to warm up over the weekend. We are looking at cloudy skies on Saturday with high at 35 degrees and low at 26. Temperatures are looking pretty good for this Super Bowl Sunday. Temps will warm up up to 40 degrees and at high at night, temperature will drop at 31 degrees. All this weather does not mean a thing in Atlanta, considering the game will be played inside. Sunday temperatures in Atlanta are expected to warm up to 61 degrees and a lo low at 48 degrees. There is also going to be some rain. It is going to be humid throughout the week, peaking at 74% on Sunday. Expect no more traffic every 3 and 495. The weather conditions are good. Safe travels, everyone. And now to the news. There were a few news stories over the week, and here are the headlines. Wareham Week was buzzling with this news headline Thursday. Bye-bye, Toby Homestead. The Wenham Historic Commission voted 3-1 last night for the demolition of Toby Homestead. The demolition request comes after South Coast shared their plans for a $25 million emergency department expansion. The commission has approved a certificate of hardship for South Coast Health. Hospital officials have one year to produce plans or else they will risk losing the right to tear the homestead down. And in another news, groovy, bold, and colorful. A Quincy native, Brenda Morrison, has been making and selling handcrafted glass items for over 25 years. Her next art show will be, in, will be on February 9th in Marion at the For Love of Art Trunk show. Also, Wicked Local Wareham had this headline on Thursday. The Wareham School District says $175,000 is not enough for the Anderson Tracks renovation. The Community Preservation Committee voted on a budget of $175,000 towards renovations of Anderson Track. Originally, the Wareham School District had asked for $500,000. This week, School Superintendent Kim, Dr. Kimberly Sheverhood said that that would be a band aid solution to a very real problem. And she went on to share this statement in an email to the CPC on Monday, and I quote, We are grateful for the offer of $175,000, but at this time we would like to decline the amount. That is all I have for the news headlines. Wenham Week is here this morning to cover the story of the day, so stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break.
and welcome back. On Fridays, we ask ourselves this question. Why read the news while you can chat with the news source? We are joined with Matt Burnett, editor at Wareham Week newspaper, to cover the story of the day. Two major events took place last night, the Toby Homestead hearing and an iconic Wareham resident, Richard Wheeler, passed away. Welcome, Matt. Hi, Queen. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're supposed to have Megan. We were. She couldn't make it today, okay. but she will be here next week. Well, thank you for your commitment. So let's start with the demolition hearing, the Toby Homestead. Yes, that was last night mm -hmm. in Town Hall Auditorium. Very well attended. The hall was filled with people. Okay. Uh, there were police there, and it was to decide, uh, the Historic District Commission had to decide if they would allow uh, South Coast Health yes. to tear down the Toby Homestead. And they did. They voted 3-1, yes, to tear it down. Mm -hmm. But there are some conditions attached. All right. So South Coast has to come up with a plan that appropriately pays uh, homage mm -hmm. to the building, which was Alice Toby Jones's home yes. back in the 1800s. And they have one year to do that. And if they don't, then the district uh, commission will take away the certificate. Okay. Meaning they can't tear it down. So, l more questions coming your way. Uh, how many people attended last night? Uh, uh, probably close to 200 people were in the hall that night. Wow. And a lot of people spoke. Everyone spoke in favor. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were sad to see it go, but they realized that for the new emergency departments, the, ho the homestead has to come down. Okay. So, the South, South Coast... South Coast, yes. South Coast uh, has one year to come with the, yep. the plans. Did you speak to them? How likely I didn't, they abide to I didn't speak to, to them this? yet. Uh, I believe they will. I know uh, in my hometown of Palmer, mm. there's a Wing Memorial Hospital. Okay. And when you first walk in, there's a long hallway, big uh, photographs of, you know, the old hospital. And, like, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a little museum, pretty much. So I imagine South Coast will want to do something similar. Okay with their new plans for the department, which is going to be $25 million, 25,000 square feet, yeah. and it will be able to serve 40,000 patients a year. Okay. Right now, they can only serve 15,000, but they actually treat 30,000, so it is badly needed. Okay, so the, as you said, a lot of people were for it, the director, the um, emergency service director. Yeah, we had police chief John Walchek. Mm -hmm. He spoke in favor. His father actually sat on the Historic District Commission at one point. Okay. So he, he loves history. He's been in town his whole life and he sat to see it go, but from his perspective mm. as a you know police chief, the hospital needs to be expanded. Okay. Um, Same and with Wareham's fire chief. Okay. And the emergency... Uh, ambulance. Yes, the ambulance director, okay. Dave Evans. All right, so all those people from the safety perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and how about the residents, those who said, yes, tear it down? Mm -hmm. What did they say? They had, uh, there was one gentleman, Richard Swenson. He kind of captured kind of the mood mm -hmm. of the meeting. He was also sad to see it go. But he said, uh, the availability of quality health care is the number one concern for citizens, and opportunities to expand that don't come along very often. I'm 65 years old, and I'm going to be using that emergency room I want the new one. Okay. And that got a big, big round of applause from people in the, uh, in the hall there. Now, do we know how long the expansion is going to take? I have asked South Coast, and they don't have a definitive timeline. Mm -hmm. They want to get this going as soon as possible. All right. So probably within a couple years. They don't want to wait. But and now that, so they have one year before they can d demolish the building. Right, so well. they, they could come up with those plans tomorrow. Okay. I don't think they will. Mm -hmm. I'll have to reach out to them and see how soon they want to get the commission those plans, because they have to go back for final approval still. Okay. Now, and not everybody was happy. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have um, th th those Jeff Sweat, mm -hmm. who also serves on the Wareham School Committee. He was ambivalent about the whole ordeal. Yes. Uh, he's also a longtime resident. Mm -hmm. He likes, you know, the way the building looks. It's, it's a local landmark. Yes. But he brought up a point, um, the increasing cost of health care. Mm -hmm. He mentioned that there was a study out, most, most people in the country can't afford a $400 expense mm -hmm. without having to sell something or go into debt. Okay. And even if you have insurance, your deductibles could be thousands of dollars, an emergency room visit could be $500. And he just, uh, this is what Jeff Sweat said at the hearing. Mm. Uh, it occurred to me that in some ways it's crazy to sacrifice a beautiful homestead for something that people can't afford or have to go into debt to afford. I want to leave South Coast officials with that meaning the high cost of health care. Yes. 
But they're not in control of that. No, those, I believe that's the health insurance companies. Mm -hmm. That's something that's out of my wheelhouse, so. Okay, but he just wanted to get it off his chest. Yeah, he, I, you know, it's a huge problem across the country. Absolutely. Health care costs go up every single year. Mm -hmm. Wages aren't going up. Yes. So it's kind of this thorny issue that came up briefly at last night's hearing. Yes, we literally cannot afford to be sick. Mm. Um, and also we had a resident, Holly, I cannot Oh, I'm having trouble pronouncing her last name. Holly Hartuni. Hartuni. She had requested a compromise. Could you tell us about the compromise? Yes, she stood up, and because South Coast is a nonprofit, mm -hmm. all of their financials are, you know, out in the open. They're public for people to check out. So she listed what their net income was. She listed the CEO's salary, mm -hmm. and she basically said, "Why not just take?" some money mm -hmm. and move it. 500,000. She didn't just say some yes, money. Yes, she said 500,000. And her plan was hopefully they could move it mm -hmm. to somewhere else in town, maybe make a museum. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just read what she said. This is Holly Artunian mm. speaking to officials. You have tons of money. Spend $500,000 and move the building. Please don't tear it down. To those of us who live in Wareham, it's one of the most important pieces of our town. Okay, but $500,000 for a building that survived fire, for a building right. that really you can't utilize it for anything. Apparently the problem is, I haven't been inside, mm -hmm. but according to people who have, um, the outside looks great, yes. but the inside, there's nothing in there. There's no electrical. It's during the fire back in 1985, mm. the frame was compromised, so it might come down if you move it. There's a lot of questions to still answer. Okay. So even if you did move it, it might not be in good shape for a museum. We oh. just don't know. Now, was our town administrator present last night? He, he was. He only spoke uh, briefly to, oh, you know what? He actually read from Alice Toby Jones's will. Okay. There was a clause in there that said it's okay to tear down a building, mm -hmm. you know, if the hospital has to expand, that's your priority. You want uh, better health care for, for residents. Yes. And if that means, you know, some things have to come down, then... It's, it's what she would have wanted, okay. basically. Now, do you think a new, renovated, bigger emergency room is going to um, add value to our town? Oh, definitely. Okay. In fact, I believe, I think he was the, I forget, it was someone from the Marriott Hotel mm -hmm. down the street, which went up a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and he said they've seen more guests come in. Yes for the hospital. Okay. So they're expecting maybe the town will actually get a little more revenue from people visiting because Toby Toby with the new department it'll be a destination. It'll be probably the most advanced biggest emergency department on the south coast. I don't know about Cape Cod but maybe okay. that area too. So it would be a big attraction. So we are looking at a brand new elementary school. We're looking at a brand new uh, emergency room or what? Marijuana in the yep. town, everybody. A lot is People changing right now. It's that this an town exciting time to be in Wareham. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so let's move on to a sadder note. Yes. We lost an iconic mm -hmm. member of this society last night. Could you tell us about Richard? Yes, uh, Richard Dick Wheeler uh, passed away yesterday afternoon. He was 88 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, he's well known in town. He, he does a lot for the library. But his claim to fame was in 1991, he kayaked uh, 1,500 miles from Nova Scotia down to here, the south coast, mm -hmm. and he was bringing awareness to the great auk, which was a bird that was drove to extinction by people in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And that journey was documented by PBS for their Nova series. And after that, um, Time magazine actually named him a hero of the planet oh, okay. in 1998 for oh, his efforts. God. And he actually continued kayaking and swimming into his 80s. Yes. Uh, let me find the date here. In 2011, mm. when he was 80 years old, he actually uh, swam 1.2 miles across Buzzards Bay. He also circumnavigated Cape Ann for a 12-mile kayak trip. Mm -hmm. And that same year, he also competed in the Waikiki Rough Water Challenge, which was a 2.3-mile swim uh, in Hawaii. So he was very active. And now you personally, you've met him. I've seen him at a, a, quite a few events. Yeah. And How would you characterize him, his demeanor? Oh, he was, you met him and you, you just smiled. He had, he had a sparkle. He was a, a great man and really loved the town of Wareham. Yes. He really did. Uh, I know he raised money for the Wareham Free Library mm -hmm. through a lot of rowing competitions. And he would work out at the Gleason Family YMCA. He would row there. He actually uh, swam competitively in high school and at Harvard. Yes. And he joined, uh, he became a Navy SEAL when he was younger. Oh 
but back then they were called frogmen. Yes. So just all around, Gary, um, the harbor master, yeah. Gary Buckminster, uh, said a couple nice things about him yesterday for us. Just uh, the town is going to miss him great, a great deal. Well, thank you very much. Do we have information about his funeral service? Not yet. No. Nope. Okay. No, nope, I don't know. Uh, that will be coming out. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. You're welcome. Thank you. That was Matt Burnett, editor at Wenham Week newspaper, discussing sweet. Sorry, discussing about the um, the, the the death of um, an iconic member in our community, Richard Wheeler, and also we talked about the demolition of Toby Homestead. Stay with us because we have more for you. Um, First, let's take a look at a Zumba club in East Wareham in order to learn how much fun it can be to work out. If you're among millions of Americans, including myself, who feel that this past Thanksgiving, we ate way too much. And if we continue on down this trend, we may be forced to commit to a New Year's resolution. To that fear, I tell you not to worry, because there is a simpler and an exhilarating solution to shedding down those extra pounds. Yes, I'm talking about Zumba. Today, this Latin American inspired dance has spread to 186 countries and with more than 15 million happy, sweaty students taking classes every week. One of those Zumba classes can be found right here at 3065 Cranberry Highway, across from the old Benny store. Zumba is a lot of fun and I'd like people to know that it's not scary. Um, it's exercise in disguise. Zumba has proven itself to be more than exercise, rather an exclusive club where people can let loose and literally shake off their extra pounds. Well, I like to think that my group of people is a family. Um, we all are here for one goal. There's a lot of high energy, and love, and friendship, and it's more than an exercise class. It's family. As to what part of your body benefits the most when doing Zumba? Smiling to your toes, your heels, your calves, your stomach, your abs, we work our arms. We do it all. It's no drama, it's no judgment. It's you just come, you have a great time. You know, she's all about just keeping it moving and happy. Um, she just has a way of bringing people in. Just have fun. That's all, you just gotta have fun and smile and just keep moving, you know? Cause even if you forget the steps and you're still moving, you know, it's all fun, it, it's good fun. Everyone, everyone in the community, everybody who wants to dance, who wants to get into shape, who wants to have fun doing what they're doing, Infinity Dance Factory is where they
Wow, such a class can bring out great energy out of you. To learn more about Infinity Dance Factory or to sign up for one of its classes, please feel free to visit their Facebook page at Infinity Dance Factory. Reporting from East Wareham, I am Queen Banda of WCTV. I was moving that day. I was moving that day. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. I hope you learned as much as I did. So to another program, we are going to um, look at defining, um, redefining Miss America. We are going to take a look at this program. I sat down with Sarah Elizabeth Akon, Miss Plymouth, and she was telling us about her hopes on winning the Miss America beauty pageant. So take a look at her story. Here's Sarah. You don't have to be a size two to wear a crown on your head. It's about the confidence that you emulate and what you can bring forward to the table. I would love to go to Miss America and be the first plus size Miss Massachusetts. Recently, this happened. Yeah. Recently, you were crowned Miss Plymouth County. And yeah. when I first met you, you said, when I asked you what got you interested, you said, I wasn't even interested in the Miss American competitions to begin with. Right. So what switched? Well, I find that I, I tend to lean towards a, an advocate type lifestyle. And I have a friend who's been competing in it as long as I can remember. And I went to a fundraiser of hers and she was like, you know, I really want you to do this. I think you'd do really, really well. I don't see why you don't. And I was like, maybe, I'll think about it, you know. Uh, I don't know, I'm not really a huge fan of being in a swimsuit on stage. But then I realized that if I were to become a title holder, being on you know the more plus sized end of women's fashion, I would be an advocate for body positivity. And I think that that's something that we really need to push now, especially for young men. Men don't have the sort of support system that women do, where you know even though women still have a long ways to go with body positivity, men have nothing. You know, no one is out there saying, hey, it's okay that you're not ripped. It's okay, you know, if you're, you're smaller than most men. And I noticed a lot of that in my brother. My brother has always struggled with his weight just because he's, he's a stocky kid, but we're short. I'm 4'10", he's just a little bit taller than I am, so we don't have a lot for, you know, our weight to go, a lot of places for our weight to go. So I really wanted to be someone that he could reach out to. And speaking of your platform, um, I have it here, pushing the importance of body positivity in today's youth. Yes. So as you mentioned before, you said, you, you, I mean, keyword here I feel it's youth and it's mm -hmm. not only towards women or towards mm -hmm. men. And this is something that the public hasn't really touched upon. Right. Where, you know, to elevate everybody at once. So you feel like you walk in in a bathing suit, in the stage, you are able to do that. Yeah, I, I really find that it's showcasing that you don't have to be a size two to wear a crown on your head. It, it, it's about the confidence that you emulate and what you can bring forward to the table. I would love to go to Miss America and be the first plus size Miss Massachusetts. Now, has this confidence ever always been with you while you were training, like <laughs> for Miss Plymouth County? Mm -hmm. And looking at the pictures of your fellow contestants, I mean, they were a little bit skinny. I would mm -hmm. consider the typical um, body size of a right. person doing pageant. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have this confidence throughout, or did you doubt yourself, like? Maybe I won't be able to get this. I definitely doubted myself at first. The first few pageants, I was like, oh, it's, it's because I don't look good in a bikini. That's what it is. That's why I'm not winning. And in reality, it was just because it wasn't my time yet. You know, I hadn't 
proven to myself that I could do it, so how could I prove it to other people? You know, I had to learn for myself that I'm okay with the way that I am and I love my body and I fuel it correctly and I do everything that I can to make sure that I'm living a healthy lifestyle and I'm not starving myself to be, you know, teeny tiny because it's not, it's not worth it. You're going to make yourself sick. People aren't going to want you at their events if, you know, you're, you're miserable. You're miserable. Now, so, at what particular time did it occur to you like, okay, I think I can win this? Did it ever occur to you that you're going to it, it did occur to me. I, you know, I always thought that my interviews were okay. And that, that really, that's what I found was, you know, my downfall is I needed to work on my interview. I needed to work on, you know, getting to the point as fast as I possibly could. And it was the pageant before the one that I won. It was uh, Miss Middlesex County. I walked out of the interview room and I was like, oh my God. That's what a good interview feels like. That's what it is. Oh my goodness. And so I knew then that once I emulated confidence in myself and I knew that I could do it, everybody else was going to know that too. You know, Miss Plymouth County was the title that I wanted because I live in Plymouth County. So I felt as if I could do appearances in my backyard and I could do all of these things right at home. And I was like, okay, who in this room can really be a great role model and an advocate in the area and knows the area and I looked around the room and I was like I think it might be me and then I heard I heard second runner-up get called first runner-up Miss Middleborough Miss Lakeville and I was like oh my gosh don't tell me really? like oh my goodness <laughs> I cannot believe this and I was like okay it's got to be me like who you know I felt so good about my performance, and so they were like, surprise. It, it was a huge surprise. I, I think it was more of a surprise for my family, honestly, because when I competed in my first pageant, my dad was like, you're not a pageant girl. I don't see you doing this. I don't see it happening. And I was like, well, I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it until I win. Yeah. And I did, you know, wow. nevertheless, she persisted. You know, the, the, I like that quote. I just find that it, it, it really showcases who I am as a person. <laughs> but I was so excited. Oh my goodness. I was yeah, so wow. excited <laughs> that they put the crown on my head and Alyssa Musto, who is our current Miss Massachusetts, mm -hmm. she, you know, put the bobby pins in my hair. I go over to hug my my sisters yeah. who I was just crowned with the crown falls off my head but I think it also showcases the fact that I'm not perfect okay. and you know that that's what I really wanted to emulate and that's what I really wanted to show people that it's okay to not be perfect and I thought that like oh what a better way to win my crown than to drop it now speaking of the idea of not being perfect I was reading um, about the tips you know, these different bloggers and articles on how to win Miss America. Mm -hmm. So the tips for the contestants. And most of those tips focused on the body image, the outside look. You mm -hmm. know, they even pushed to say that, first of all, if you find any imperfections on yourself, seek help. Mm -hmm. such as cosmetic surgery. You know, they say at the end of the day, this is a beauty contest, mm -hmm. regardless what is advertised out there. Mm -hmm. Now, what does this say to you? I disagree with that totally. I don't think that the Miss America pageant is a beauty contest. It's a scholarship pageant. It is about being a well-rounded, well-spoken for, talented, and persistent young woman. It's about wanting to further your education and wanting to be the best person that you can be. You know, in years past, yes, Miss America started as a beauty pageant. It was a swimsuit contest. but. It has come such a long way. I don't think it's about that anymore. Basically, it's a year of service. Every title in the United States is a year of service. You are giving back to the community and you are showcasing that you are the kind of woman that should be representing the United States. Why do you feel like you'll be the best, uh, best person for this? Um, 
I think that I'm a relatable person, and I, I do find myself on, you know, the more liberal side, which Massachusetts is, we've got this beautiful liberal bubble going on, you know. So I, I think that having someone who really wants to focus on the rights of transgender people, the rights of the gay community, and the rights of women, and all of these minorities, I think that that's important to have someone who's representing the state as a whole. Sarah Elizabeth Acorn. Woo! I want to get the kids up and moving, I want them painting, I want them singing, dancing, all of these different things that bring me so much joy. And I've found well, working with these kids brings them joy. You know, art therapy is, it works. It really, really works, whether it's to help someone cope, whether it's to, you know, like an elderly person has Alzheimer's and they hear a song that reminds them of their firstborn daughter. Mm -hmm. And I really want to be not only an advocate for special education and what these kids are able to do rather than what they're unable to do. But I also want to really focus on the importance of the arts. Very good. Now, when we began this interview, you said one of the reasons why you went in this Miss America competition to begin with was to kind of give yourself confidence and also to give your brother a role model. Mm -hmm. Now, does he have a role model today? Well, he's 14. He's going to be 15. <laughs> So we have to forgive him. <laughs> yes, he, he he's a wonderful kid. He he really really is. Um, but we fight like cats and dogs. So right now I'm not his role model, but I hope that he has found someone out there who is a role model. Well, thank you so much for sitting with us. I've learned so much, and I am so happy to have met you. I hope that you get to snatch that title of Miss Massachusetts. Thank you. And you get to continue on. Yeah. In this competition. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. What a beautiful, beautiful story that was Sarah Akon. Hello and thank you for being with us this morning. We are broadcasting live from our WCTV studio in Wareham. This is Good Morning Wareham, your source for local news, weather, traffic and more information. And now for a moment in history. Let's take a look at where we were today in history. Here comes the dictionary. On this day back in 1884, the first portion of the Oxford Dictionary of the Oxford English Dictionary debuted. Plans for the dictionary began in 1857 by members of London's Philological Society. The project took over took about 40 years to finish. Final draft was published in April 1928, and the full dictionary was completed, completed at, with over 400,000 words and phrases in 10 volumes and published under the title of a New English Dictionary on History, Historical Principles. 
Today, the Oxford English Dictionary is the definitive authority on the meaning, pronunciation, and the histo history of over a million words, past and present. The Supreme Court of the United States, the highest court in the land, had its first session on this day back in 1790. February 1st, 1790, in the Loyal Exchange Building on New York City's Broad Street, the Supreme Court of the United States meets for the first time with Chief Justice John of New York presiding. The U.S. Supreme Court was established by Article 3 of the United States Constitution, which took effect in March 1789. The Constitution granted the Supreme Court ultimate ju jurisdiction over all laws, especially those in which constitutionality was at issue. And you have guessed it. Whose birthday is it? February 1st, in 1550, John Napier, Scottish mathematician and inventor, was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. And happy birthday to everybody celebrating their big birthday today. That is all I have for today in history segment. To learn more about cool histor historic facts, please go online under history.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The coffee segment is next. But first, let's take a look at our events calendar. Thank you for joining us this morning for Good Morning Wareham. We are broadcasting live from a WCTV studio in Wareham. Very soon you're going to find out just why my job is the best job in the whole world. Every day I get to interact with different people and sometimes I, when I'm extra lucky, I get to play with cute furry animals. So in today's coffee segment, we are going to visit the It Is All About the Animals, a cat shelter in Rochester, Massachusetts. Enjoy. <music> It's Queen from WCTV. We are here in Rochester visiting. It's all about the animals. We're going to be meeting with Pam, the owner of this rescue shelter and adoption center for cats. So join me. A lot of kitties. So hello, how are you doing? I am fine and how are you? I am doing very well, thank you. Okay. Now, I always pass through this road, mm -hmm. but to go to an ice cream store. Oh, yes. And I didn't know that this place mm -hmm. exists, and it's right here. We have been here nine years. Nine years. Nine years. And it's all about the animals. Absolutely. First off, we are a 501c3 nonprofit public charity. Mm -hmm. We go mainly in felines, and the reason for that is people haven't caught on how to spay and neuter your felines. They've done very well as, as far as spay and neutering the dogs, yeah. but when it comes to the felines, they don't. A lot of people still have the mindset, they're rodents, they're still disposable. Mm -hmm. 
and they just multiply, multiply, multiply. If one female cat was allowed to keep multiplying after a seven year period, if she and all her siblings survive, you can have up to 420,000 cats. That is one female cat. One female in seven cat, years. yes. A cat can go into its heat, it's called estrus. A cat can go into that three, four times a year, and a lot of it depends on the weather. You get warm weather, they're going to go into heat. I've had kittens here born Christmas Day and New Year's Day. So we focus on the abused and the abandoned. I really do not like to take out of people's homes. I like the ones that are throwaways. I cannot do ferals. We do not do ferals at all. Uh, I have been bit actually 19 times in nine years. So I have been advised, no more ferals. Um, so what we do is we take, like I say, society's throwaways. They're all spayed, neutered. They get uh, all the distempers, they get all the dewormings, both for roundworm and tapeworm. They're treated for coccidia, they're th treated for giardia. They're microchipped and tested for leukemia, FIV, and if I have the SNAP test, because sometimes they have a problem with the um, heartworm test, I will test them for feline leukemia, FIV, and heartworm. Then they're put up for adoption. Then, so all that procedure takes place when you get the cat. Exactly. Exactly. Everything is done when I get the cat. And yes. what's the significance of putting a chip on the cat? Uh, pe some people think it's a GPS. It is not a GPS. If your animal gets out of the home and it gets lost and say another animal control officer finds it or another shelter, there's a little uh, a device that we have and you just push a big button, run it across the back of the animal and if it beeps, a number will come up and with three minutes I can get on the computer and find out who owns that cat. So that's the importance of having a microchip. Cats love to sneak outside. Yes. They'll push the screen out of a window. And sometimes they don't want to come back. So, and they'll get lost. Um, and one thing I'd like to, like to say, if you don't mind, which is very important, if your cat ever gets outside and doesn't come around, the first thing you do is you take the cat's litter box. You put the litter box outside. You take towels, blankets, anything that has a scent of the home, and you put it around the perimeter of your property. Cats go by scent. So if they do wander, they can get the scent to come back home. That's a very important thing for people to do if the cat escapes. I wish I knew that because I was babysitting my brother's house. Mm -hmm. um, this was last year and they have a cat. Mm -hmm. And this cat is an out inside an outdoor okay. cat, so there was no problem. I was told, okay, you can just let the cat go uh -huh. outside. So I did so. The cat went outside, and I'm here waiting and waiting, and I was getting nervous. Mm -hmm. Like the cat is not coming home, and I didn't know what to do. I mean, just where would I start searching for well, the cat? It's a litter box first thing, and another thing that I can't emphasize enough to the people: we have a lot of fishers in Massachusetts now. It is not a cat. Um, over in Europe, they call it a fisher cat because it climbs a tree. But it's a member of the weasel family. And I've heard people say time and time again, oh, my cat can climb a tree. Well, so can a fisher. A fisher can climb up to 50 feet, but they have back legs that twist. So they're able to climb back down. The feline is stuck up in the tree. Back about maybe six years ago, uh, a whole week of Christmas during a severe snowstorm, this cat was stuck up. 75 feet up a tree. Well, we tried um, for seven days to get that cat. Finally, we got the fire department and the cat was nearly frozen to the limb. So I had to make a decision I didn't like, but I said to them, the cat had crawled up to 85 feet. I said to them, cut the limb. They cut the limb and it was on the edge of the wood. So all the branches were sticking up to impale this cat. And when they cut that limb and that cat fell, we heard boom and I'm like, the cat was going to die anyhow. I'm like, oh, dear Lord. We got there. The cat landed in about a six-foot area, which was just packed with snow. So the animal ran. My husband and I spent all night in the woods with snowsuits on, on the ground, crawling through the thickets, trying to find this cat. We set up traps. The next day, which was New Year's Day, the cat was caught in the trap. We got the cat. They got the cat. And the only thing that was wrong with this cat, it had torn hams hamstrings. So we kept the cat here, nursed her back to health, and she's now adopted. No beans. This is a terrible kitten to bottle feed. <laughs> come on, here, yeah, this way. No, 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 no. Come on, come on, wait. Oh, you are being naughty. Come on, come 
No? Why do you fight me all the time? Show everybody what a bad kid you are. Look at me. So tell me mm -hmm. your love and passion, dedication. Oh, we would do anything. <laughs> Where does this come from? I come from a family that always loved animals, always. I was always brought up with the animals. I mean, my parents spayed and neutered. I remember when I was like five years old, gotta get the animals spayed. Um, we were huge animal advocates. And my son, my grandson, they're the same way. So why do you have such a special place for cats specifically? Cats are the underdog. Okay. Um, dogs now, like I said before, they do a very good job with spay and neutering the dogs. A lot of dogs now are coming up from the south because the whole New England area has done a wonderful job with spay and neutering. So there aren't any puppies available. So they bring them up from the south. But there's tons and tons and tons of kittens and cats. So many of them. I mean, so many. Last year I had, I think it was 170 kittens that I, I did last year. Yeah. And a lot of them are bottle fed. We're bottle feeding now. Um, we got some in that were um, two days old. They were in very, very bad shape. But I also have, which I don't know if you're going to go in the unit, but I'll show you. We have an ICU unit in there. You can connect uh, oxygen. You can regulate the temperature. You can put um, humidity, c control the humidity. That has saved so many animals, that unit. So when we got these little guys, they were cold. They were real cold. You've got to get the body temperature up slowly and have it go around the animal, not just on one side. So we put them in this little unit, and right now they're doing well. They're uh, about three weeks old. Wow. You get these fishes that just rip these cats apart. And I've been telling people that. And just with the diseases that are out there. You let your cat out, it catches a disease, it's going to spread it to the next. So it's very important. Uh, you have colonies which are feral cats, they are fine. They've been taken care of, leave the ferals alone. Don't shoot them, don't do all those mean things to them. They have feeders that go there and feed and take care of them and then watch these cats. They're fine, they'll cut down the mouse population in the area. Uh, it's just that they are not adoptable. You know, they don't want any human contact, that is their life. And what happens, the colony slowly dies off on its own. But once you start destroying these cats, it's, it's something in the cat that they know. They have to keep multiplying even more. So leave them alone. Let them do, you know, let them do what they want. Wow. You, you're talking about the, you know, the struggles of um, not making enough to, you know, help more cats because it's not about paying people, paying yourself, but really not making enough in order to spread your services. But you see, at the end of the day, you have this smile on your face that, oh, you know, no matter how it. much you spend or love it. how troubling it is, love it. but Absolutely. you are happy for love the outcomes. It. I would never, ever stop doing what I'm doing, ever. I totally love it. What advice would you have for when we see a stray cat? If the cat is friendly and you want to take the cat in, which I beg everybody during the bad winter, please open up your basement. Do something for these animals that are out there. Um, if the cat is friendly and you want to take the cat in, put it in a separate room. Never mix it with your own cats. You don't know if this cat has leukemia. You don't know if it has another disease and it's going to spread to yours. Keep it in that room and call a shelter or take it to a veterinarian. And how has this experience been for you? Phenomenal. Okay. Every, I have a thing I say, every day I feel like I hit the lottery. It brings us such joy. My husband and I, we just love this so much. We were discussing, um, we were leaving today, and I have a joke with my husband. He'll say, boy, you did a good job. I said, good, now we're going to Jared's. <laughs> I'm buying that four carat ring. And he asked me, would you? I said, never. Never would I do that. That means nothing to me. He said, you know, we have given up a lot for the animals. I said, yeah, we have. Any regrets? I said, not one. He said, neither do I. So, I mean, tell us about the, the kittens and the cats that you have here. What kind of personality do they have? Well, a kitten is a kitten. Okay. I've never seen a kitten without a different personality. And everybody wants kittens, but I try explaining to them. Mm -hmm. They say, I want to train my cat to be lovable. You can't train a cat to be lovable. No. A cat is what it is. Um, <laughs> if you get a kitten, you, are, you do not know the personality of that cat. When that cat's like four months old, you know the personality. So I always try to push 
go for the four month, the five month. Okay. You know the personality of that cat. Um, but although the cats I've adopted, I have a lot of people call me best cat in the world, best cat in the world. So I guess we do a lot of socializing okay. with the cats. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I cannot wait to see the cats. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Now you haven't gone into the other unit, so you don't have to disinfect your feet. Okay. Okay. All right. So if you want to come in here, mm -hmm. please watch your footing with these babies. Oh, yes. Now these guys are five weeks old. I do not let them go till they're a minimum of eight weeks old. Oh, okay. Um, at this age, they're probably pretty safe, but there is something called failure to thrive. We've had kittens five weeks old seem very healthy like this, and all of a sudden they die. It reminds me like of SIDS in a child. Yes. Yeah. So eight weeks old, they can go. Hi. 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 Do they have names? Hey. Um, I haven't named them yet. I really don't like to name until I know that. <laughs> <laughs> see the, how's the nails? <laughs> Can you say hi? Can you say hi? All right. <laughs> that would have been adorable. Big you say hi. Ever. See? Hi. Okay, we're not going to be coming off my back. No, no. Hey, you hey, right you want to be here? You want to say hello too? Can you say hello? Huh? And I do emphasize to people, Without another animal in the house, yeah. we like to do it in pairs. Because they are, picture yourself home alone all the time with no animal contact, or human contact. Yeah. It's lonely. Yes, yes. It's very, very lonely. People work, they leave them home alone. Hi. But if you have another animal, you can get one. Th that's Archie and this is John. Archie and John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Archie, you're on TV. <laughs> oh my goodness. Come over here, sweetie. Come on. Come on, say hi. Get over here. Oh. <laughs> they're, they're really happy because they're out of the cage. Oh my God. I can see why people would want to come here and just play yeah. with this all, yeah. all day. Yeah. And so how see, frequently do they get adopted? Uh, kittens fast. are fast. Okay. Kitten, kittens are fast. But I'm very strict on oh. my ad adoption policies. Oh, right. I just don't hand them out. I'm pretty strict. Okay, now yes. we got to spray our feet. We can actually spray over there, it doesn't matter. What you're going to do, you just do this to the bottoms of your feet. Okay. Okay? That's it. So you do you do, that this, let's you? say like if you have your own cat in your house and you're going to your friend's house and they have a cat, do you necessarily have to do I this? I do it. Oh, okay. I do it and I wash my hands. Okay. Like when we go in there, I have disinfectant. Yes. I want to have you disinfect because you touch those cats. Okay, wow. so you're going to disinfect. A lot of things that we don't know. A lot of things. Let's see if she gave birth. Hey, look at that tummy. Look at that tummy. I think it's time for babies. Hey, I think it's time for babies. And my veterinarians, um, was it Dr. Francis, the owner of Marion Animal Hospital, is phenomenal. She's taught me so, so much. There's another veterinarian that used to be there, Dr. Saw, and she was the same way. You know, and I'm a sponge. I love to learn. This one came from, I think it was Middleborough, and it was a toss away. Yep. So she's very sweet. Um, and I keep complete med chats on all my animals. And I also have a relinquished farm showing where the cat came from. I can track an animal from the minute it comes here yes. till the as soon as it leaves. The other cat we called Waddles because it got so big it was actually waddling. So I'm getting nervous because this one's starting to waddle. I'm saying, please, I don't need 12 more kittens. <laughs> don't try to break the, her record. I know. Oh, it's so beautiful. She is. 
She what? is. But that's a young cat. That's a very young cat already pregnant. How young? She, I want to put her about 10 months and she's already pregnant. Because I had a distemper this morning. I gave him a distemper shot oh. this morning, their first one. So their hinds are a little bit sore. And they get a little bit tired. Hey, sweetie. So what is the significance of keeping them in this? Well, right now they're little. Okay. I don't want them jumping around and getting yes. hurt. Okay. You don't have to spray it here. Okay. Okay. Now, this is, this is very strict. Because mm. the first carpenter said to me, I want everything out so we can start working. So I got rid of all, they have beautiful cubbies. I gave them to another shelter. And then he did this. Mm. So everything is there. When you declaw an animal, I'll ask people, I want to ask you for example. What is it when, you explain to me what declawing is. Well, I think for them it's stripping their identity. Right? No, but what do they physically do to the cat? Cut their nails off? Cut the nails off? No. They amputate. It is a must visit shelter when you have a chance. Please go and take a look. If you missed us this morning, this episode will re-air this evening at 6. Join us the Monday. The YMCA will be here. And I wish you all a wonderful weekend. May the best team win.